Today, we are pleased to welcome Rich Condon. Rich is a historian from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with a bachelor's in public history from Shepherd University. For 10 years, he has worked with a multitude of sites and organizations, including the Battle of Franklin Trust, Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum, Harpers Ferry National Historical Park, Flight 93 National Memorial, and since spring 2020, Rich has served as a park ranger at Reconstruction Era National Historical Park in Beaufort, South Carolina. Uh, he's written for Civil War Times, the American Battlefield Trust, as well as Emerging Civil War, and I try frequently to get him to do more writing for us at Emerging Civil War, and I haven't been successful. Uh, but he also operates the uh, Civil War P Pittsburgh blog, and he's got a lot of fantastic stuff there, uh, which focuses on the interpretation of Western Pennsylvania's role in the Civil War. Now, there is rarely a week that goes by uh, that Rich and I are in, not in communication. Uh, we, we talk frequently. He's one of my uh, great friends in our uh, little Civil War uh, history community. He's a great historian. He's a good friend. He's a better man. Ladies and gentlemen, our last speaker on 2022, the Pittsburgh kid, Rich Condon. Thank you so much. You're a great hype man, by the way. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better introduction. Uh, my name's Rich, uh, for those who don't know me, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm happy to be back home in Pittsburgh from uh, sunny, sunny Beaufort, South Carolina. Beaufort, South Carolina. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, I feel right at home. The first day I'm back here, it's uh, gloomy weather, a little bit of rain. I'm wearing a sweater. I haven't done that in months. Um, so I couldn't have asked for anything, anything more. Um, you know, I... Uh, of course, I, I haven't talked about anything Civil War Pittsburgh related in months, maybe a couple of years uh, back here. Of course, the pandemic kind of put a, a hold on things. Um, but so it's a pleasure to be speaking about something Civil War Pittsburgh related. What we're going to talk about today, though, of course, is the Grand Arm of the, Re of the Republic. And what better place to do that than right here, uh, right across the hall from the Thomas Eskey Post. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about, of course, is not just the Grand Army of the Republic, but a specific gathering, um, which took place in 1894 right here in Pittsburgh, the 28th annual uh, encampment that took place in Pittsburgh and Allegheny City, what is now Pittsburgh's north side. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what did this encampment look like? I mean, uh, you know, this is one of the largest JR gatherings in any city in the nation uh, at this point in time. But it's also happening at a time uh, where there's a lot of struggle and strife in our country. We're in the middle of an economic depression, for example. We're at a point in time where um, you know, veterans are now dying off by the dozens. We're at a point in our history, a crossroads in our history, where how do we memorialize these people? Um, and so we'll cover some of that stuff. You know, I'll cover kind of the day-to-day -day things that are happening in September of 1894 during this gathering. But really, I want to focus on um, you know, what are the veterans thinking as all of this is going on? What are they thinking about these uh, ongoing situations that are happening outside of Pittsburgh at that point in time? So uh, I have a lot of uh, uh, firsthand accounts that I'm going to share with you, written or spoken by the veterans themselves um, on a multitude of, of issues, uh, whether it be the economic depression, uh, social hardship, and, um, you know, of course, uh, being able to memorialize themselves. Um, how is the Civil War going to be remembered as we move into the 20th century? Um, of course, these are things that maybe they didn't think of uh, right after the war is over, but as they're aging, this is in the forefront of their minds. Um, so one, one other thing we'll talk about I want to focus heavily on is this idea of reconciliation in the post-war period. Um, by show of hands, uh, how many of us have seen Ken Burns Civil War? Well, pretty much everybody, okay. Well, I'm gonna show you a, a clip here in just a minute that you might remember from uh, the Ken Burns series that I think drive home, drives home the point of reconciliation uh, as we move into the 1940s even. Um, and it's kind of the, the vision that we have of uh, not only Union, but Confederate veterans uh, as we move into a time period when uh, those veterans are not around anymore. 
Um, speaking of veterans, um, this is a kind of a, a timely program as you know, we just observed Veterans Day uh, yesterday. So by show of hands, uh, how many veterans do we have in the room right now? All right, can we get a round of applause for veterans? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, you know, the, the veterans that are in this room, uh, do you all belong to uh, the, the, the VFW or American Legion, um, organizations like that? Well, of course, these organizations that exist today, um, these veterans organizations, have their roots in the Grand Army of the Republic, the GAR. Um, this organization that started in the post-Civil War period, um, organized by Union Army veterans um, for several reasons. You know, of course, they start um, as a, a way to kind of you know, talk about things that maybe uh, people in civilian life may not be able to relate to. Um, they have these organizations, so perhaps they can raise funds um, you know, to, to, to help these veterans carry on a normal life after the war is over. Uh, much, you know, much what a lot of these veterans organizations do uh, today. So first off, I'm gonna share this clip with you and I'll shut up for a second. All right, so how many of you remember that clip? Okay. So when you think of you know reconciliation, for example, in the post Civil War period. By the way, this this is from 1938. So um, this is really one of the last large gatherings of these veterans um, on a Civil War battlefield. You know, when you think of reconciliation in the post war period, this is kind of what we envision. Um, you know, Union and Confederate veterans shaking hands across the stone wall. Um, you know, bearing the hatchet in the post war period. Um, talking more about probably. Um, what happened during the Civil War as opposed to why the Civil War actually happened. Um, and so that's kind of what we think about today. Um, I think um, a lot of camps are starting to, to, to shift um, that interpretation of the Civil War a little bit. Um, but, you know, we still like to focus on kind of this interpretation of reconciliation in the post-war period. What we're going to do is we're going to use this 1894 uh, encampment here in Pittsburgh to, um, to interpret this idea of reconciliation. We're gonna use this to, um, um, as a lens to look at, you know, what are these guys thinking when they're passing uh, down Fifth Avenue in downtown Pittsburgh? But first let's talk a little bit about the Grand Army of the Republic itself. Um, the Grand Army of the Republic was formed in April of 1866. So barely a year after the guns went silent at Appomattox. Um, it's formed actually in Illinois, of all places, uh, formed by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Uh, Benjamin Stevenson, a uh, major in the 14th Illinois Infantry. Um, ben Stevenson uh, had talked about this idea of forming this organization um, just as, as the war is going on. In fact, I believe he was talking to his messmate about, you know, what are we going to do when we go home? You know, who are we going to talk about? Who are we going to talk about this stuff with? when we go home, uh, these, these experiences that probably most people cannot relate to. And of course, um, the seeds have been planted for the Grand Army of the Republic, which comes to fruition in April 1866, um, comes to fruition with this first post that started in Decatur, Illinois, uh, by, by Dr. Stevenson. And of course, um, this organization, as it grows, as it starts to spread from 1866 onward, um, is, is going to be open to all U.S. military veterans from the American Civil War. Whether you served uh, one week in the Army or three years, um, it's, it's open to all these folks. 
you know, there's a lot of guys who enlisted in just the last month or two months of the Civil War who are part of the Grand Army of the Republic. And this organization is going to be in operation until 1956 with the death of the last uh, U.S. Army veteran, uh, Albert Wilson who I believe there's a, a monument to him at uh, Gettysburg National Military Park. Um, but this organization is founded on uh, three core principles, fraternity, charity, and loyalty. So let's look at uh, what they mean by that. Fraternity um, is this idea to preserve and strengthen those kind and fraternal feelings which bound together the soldiers, sailors, and Marines who united to suppress the late rebellion and perpetuate the memory and history of the dead. Charity, to assist such former comrades in arms as needed help and protection and to exceed needful aid to the widows and orphans of those who had fallen. And finally, loyalty, to maintain true allegiance to the United States based on a paramount respect for and fidelity to its constitutions and laws and encourage the spread of universal liberty, equal rights, and justice to all men. This is the, you know, anytime you see a, a letter um, formal correspondence between officers and the Grand Army of the Republic. The, the, the sign-off line is Fraternity, Charity, or Loyalty, loyalty or uh, FCL. Um, this is everything they live by. And so, of course, uh, they're not just taking care of the veterans themselves. Um, they're taking care of their families. They're taking care of widows. They're taking care of orphans. Um, you know, they'll be helping to set up... Um, soldiers' homes later in the 19th century, or orphans' homes, for example. So especially at a time of, of financial hardship in, say, the early 1890s, the Grand Army of the Republic yields a lot of power, um, especially financially. Um, these people will become reliant on the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, and they're actually going to, uh, to have several different lifespans. You know, like I said, the Grand Army starts in 1866 in Illinois, It'll be in existence uh, largely until the early uh, 1870s. Um, you know, at that point in time, the Grand Army uh, is still in existence, but it's fizzling out in a lot of places, uh, mostly because a lot of these veterans see it as, well, we've accomplished a lot of our go goals uh, in the post-war period. Um, things like trying to achieve equal rights for, for African-American veterans. By equal rights, I mean the ideas of citizenship, uh, or voting rights that came with the 14th and 15th Amendments. Of course, the last of the amendments passed in 1870, of course. And the Grand Army of the Republic is trying to take less of a stance politically, even though a majority of these veterans are uh, staunch Republicans, um, they're not taking as much of a stance politically by the early 1870s. Um, in fact, in 1868, at the Philadelphia um, gathering, um, they declared the purpose of the GAR was to, quote, secure the rights of the defenders of their country by all moral, social, and political means in our control. Yet this association does not design to make nominations for the office or to use its influence as a secret organization for partisan purposes. Um, and so as some of these veterans see that, you know, they're not moving into this, this uh, necessarily political direction, a lot of them start to, to drop off in membership. But this membership will pick up again as we start to move into the late 1870s, uh, early 1880s. Of course, as these veterans are getting older, they're trying to secure pensions. Um, and the Grand Army of the Republic uh, is this organization that's going to help them, um, you know, uh, kind of work with the government to get these pensions in the post-war period. So, of course, they start to see a boost in numbers. Uh, by 1890, the Grand Army of the Republic boasts a membership of about 400,000 men across the country. Um, there are uh, 45 departments across the United States. Um, and of course, there's over uh, 7,500 posts around the country as well. So uh, each year uh, following the Civil War, they'd have these, uh, these grand encampments, they would call them. Um, basically just large meetings. They would pick a different city uh, across the country for each, each gathering. And of course, 1894, uh, it was voted that Pittsburgh would be the meeting place for the Grand Army. Uh, it was voted uh, actually the year prior in 1893 as they met in Indianapolis, the 28th, uh, sorry, 27th annual encampment. So um, let's move forward here. 
Of course, the uh, encampment, they decide they're going to hold between uh, September 10 and 14, 1894. Uh, there's at least 1,100 delegates that are present. But we know that there's an estimated 19,000 veterans that are going to be uh, marching in the parade on September 11th, 1894. At this point in time, they've also estimated that they have uh, 371,555 veterans across the nation. Um, to, to really uh, understand how many people are present for this uh, uh, gathering in Pittsburgh, though, as far as onlookers go is, is kind of impossible. Um, they estimate there's probably about 200,000 200, people present in the city of Pittsburgh uh, for this gathering. Um, and it's quite, quite remarkable the uh, lengths that they're going to uh, to pull this gathering together. You know, all the, uh, there's actually a committee that's going to be set up in Pittsburgh, um, coordinating with, with hotels and boarding houses, for example, uh, making sure that all these veterans have a place to stay while they're in town. They're making sure that uh, hotels aren't gouging people, uh, you know, trying to jack up the prices on these hotel rooms as they're starting to, to flood into the city. And of course, um, there's going to be a lot of uh, preparations and pageantry that goes into um, preparation for, um, for the, the gathering. Um, and this one, I, was, I think I was talking to uh, Rick earlier and, and John Eric about the gun here. Um, back on that table, we have some of these medals displayed, and um, you know you might look at the the back of some of these medals, and you see a little uh, a little cannon stamp on the back, and it'll say "Here and Brothers." Well, there's actually a gun reported to have been taken from Allegheny Arsenal, uh, melted down, and used to create medals that they'd be giving out to these veterans uh, as they arrive in Pittsburgh for this uh, annual encampment. This. Uh, is the reported gun that they had melted down for that purpose. Um, there's also spoons that are created, basically any kind of souvenir you can think of. On the left-hand side is actually one of those medals that was uh, um, that was created from this gun. I actually have it sitting back on that table uh, back there. So this is one of the many things they're doing in preparation to get people kind of amped up and ready for this, this grand gathering. And of course, uh, I thought this was really interesting. Um, and one of the programs that will be distributed prior to the gathering, um, they have a lot of photographs of different parts of the city where they're, you know, preparing um, lights, floral arrangements, things of that sort. Uh, this photograph was actually taken in Highland Park. You can see the Grand Army Star, you know, front and center, right in the middle of this flower garden with uh, several different core badges scattered around. On the left hand side, for example, you can see the second core badge. Um, and of course, there's stuff like this is happening all across the city. And uh, of course, you know, a lot of these veterans are showing up on September 10th um, and September 9th as well. Um, you, not, you not only have Grand Army veterans, but you also have uh, Navy veterans that are showing up. Eventually, you'll have ex-prisoners of war. I believe uh, Rick has one of their ribbons back there. Um, and so uh, they're kind of the, the, the grand opening of this encampment will be September 11th, when they're gonna have a grand parade through the streets of Pittsburgh uh, and Allegheny City. And so I have here a map of the city where you can see that the uh, procession actually starts on the wharf along the Allegheny River right there. Um, all the departments will be forming up. I believe uh, head of the, the parade will be uh, Indiana, you'll have uh, Massachusetts, New York, formed up along the street there. They will go across the Allegheny River, across the 6th Street Bridge uh, over into Allegheny City. They're gonna march around the commons and uh, this parade will actually end. Uh, how many of you have been to Park House before on Pittsburgh's North Side? Yeah, I love Park House. Unfortunately, it's not around anymore. Um, I don't think, is it, is it open yet? I heard it closed during the pandemic. That's why I was asking. Uh, uh, Park House on uh, East Ohio Street and Cedar Avenue, that's the terminus point of this procession. Um, right across from there in the uh, the Commons area, about where the, the Hamptons Battery Monument is, um, a lot of these guys are going to, uh, to retire there and, and move off. Um, I do have a, a few photos I want to share with you. These are actually from my personal collection. Uh, these were all stereo views uh, that were actually taken during the parade through Pittsburgh. Um, the photograph on the left-hand side, I'm unsure where that was taken. I haven't been able to confirm that quite yet. 
The one on the right-hand side, though, is taken on Fifth Avenue in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, what's pretty unique about this is, too, you can see that large uh, arch that's been erected over Fifth Avenue. And uh, top, you can see, uh, if you look very closely, uh, three figures um, that are uh, erected up there. Um, and right below it, if you zoom in really hard, you can see the, uh, the core uh, values of the GAR. Um, fraternity, uh, loyalty, and, and charity. Um, you can see these guys in formation carrying their battle flags. Often, you know, if they're in decent enough shape, they are carrying their Civil War battle flags, or of course their uh, GAR post flags. Um, I do have uh, right here with me the uh, one of the programs from the procession, and so I want to share with you the uh, the actual parade route. They line it out for us right here. Um, the parade route moves over Smithfield Street to 4th Avenue, to Grant Street, to 5th Avenue, to Liberty Street, to 5th Street, to Duquesne Way, to 6th Street Bridge, to Federal Street, to Ohio Street, to Marion Avenue, to Ridge Avenue, to Irwin Avenue, to North Avenue, to Cedar Avenue, where the column will pass and review and be dismissed. So, of course, at the end of the parade, um, there's also a review stand, and uh, I'll show you a picture of that here shortly as well. Of course, the, uh, the photo on the left here is the, uh, they call it the St. Clair Street Bridge, the 6th Street Bridge. They'll pass over that as they go to uh, Allegheny City. And I believe that view actually is looking toward Allegheny City. And the photograph on the right um, is actually right after they had crossed the bridge into Allegheny City. Um, I believe on the right-hand side is where PNC Park is located today on Federal Street. And as they're passing over to Cedar Avenue uh, in Pittsburgh's north side is the review stand. And so you can see on the left-hand side here, um, you have the uh, commander-in-chief of the GAR, John Adams, who I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, you have uh, governor of Ohio, William McKinley. Uh, Dan Sickles, I believe, is on the stand as well. Um, so you have quite a few well-known figures that are attending this event that are, uh, are watching here from the grandstand, reviewing these veterans as they pass down Cedar Avenue toward the terminus of the parade. Um, on the right-hand side, this is an excerpt I took from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I was published the day after the parade. And uh, I'm glad that Rick brought um, that, that flag from Missouri that, what was it, a captured flag from Post-88? This, uh, this flag you can see, uh, these departments would carry a banner. Um, as they're uh, processing through through the streets of Pittsburgh. And you, you can see one of those flags hanging above these GAR veterans. And of course, you see a guy in the very front of the column uh, on crutches missing a leg. And so the, uh, the caption for this image is, left his leg at Gettysburg. Um, let's see here. I apologize. So, um, the, uh, uh, there's a couple other things I want to mention to you uh, as these, these men are um, marching through the streets of Pittsburgh. You know, of course, they're thinking about um, walking, uh, you know, walking toward their, their, their you know, this legacy, um, this legacy that, you know, hopefully this will be preserved. Hopefully this will be remembered by the folks that are looking um, looking onward, you know, if you look at these photographs, you can see people hanging out the windows of these hotels. You can see kids that are actually hanging from telephone poles um, or telegraph poles on the streets of Pittsburgh. You know, these veterans are thinking, how is this going to be remembered um, as we start to move into a new century? Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the things that I kind of want to focus on today is how is this all going to be remembered? How do these veterans interpret uh, this end of the 19th century as we move into a new era. And I want to start with this guy, uh, John G.B. Adams. Uh, John Adams is a commander-in-chief of the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, he was elected to this position in 1893, the previous year. In fact, during the 1894 encampment here in Pittsburgh, uh, there will be a new commander-in-chief elected to take his place. Uh, but he's a pretty interesting character. Um, you know, John Adams... Uh, served in the 19th Massachusetts Infantry. Uh, he had received the Congressional Medal of Honor for actions at Fredericksburg. Uh, in fact, um, I believe several of their uh, 
color guard having killed an action and he actually picked up two colors and taken them to safety and so for that action he receives the medal of honor uh, July 2nd, 1863, he's wounded at the Battle of Gettysburg, and uh, it didn't end there. Um, about less than a year later at Cold Harbor, uh, he's wounded and captured by Confederate troops and eventually imprisoned in, uh, in South Carolina, uh, as well as I believe he was taken to, uh, to Andersonville. So he's obviously seen a lot. Um, you know, John G.B. Adams is a guy who... Uh, has the material to lead this, this organization, the Grand Army of the Republic, on a national scale. Um, John Adams, of course, also probably harbors um, some not necessarily uh, not necessarily uh, reconcili reconciliatory uh, values um, as we look toward the future. Of course, he harbors hope for that, though. And so, you know, the day after, I'm sorry, the, the, the night of the parade and the day after on September 12th, 1894, after this parade is over, you know, these, these veterans are going to hold individual meetings. Um, they hold regimental meetings and post meetings. Um, and so, you know, this is where they start to, to talk about these different issues that they may maybe been thinking about as they're preparing to come here to Pittsburgh for this annual encampment. And so uh, one of the things that they're going to discuss, and really one of the long-lasting legacies of the Grand Army of the Republic, is uh, Memorial Day. You know, this is something that we still observe today in 2022. Um, this is something that actually started officially um, in 1868 uh, as a general order created by John A. Logan. Um, John A. Logan, of course, uh, being a Civil War veteran who uh, commanded the 15th uh, U.S. Army Corps in the post-war period, uh, heavily uh, politically involved as well. But, um, you know, as they bury the Union dead in the American South uh, the, in the post-war period, um, they start to bury these soldiers in national cemeteries. How do we memorialize these soldiers in the South? Um, you know, they, they come together and they decide, all right, this, this day, uh, May 30th is going to be uh, the day that we remember these, these men every year. And so uh, by orders number 11, John Logan says the 30th day of May 1868 is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet, churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form of ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades will, in their own way, arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. So, of course, uh, in these different cities and towns throughout the South and the North, Grand Army posts gather together this one day out of the year, and they decorate the graves of their comrades. And, of course, uh, they're joined eventually by uh, women's auxiliaries, uh, like the ladies of the GAR. Um, or the Women's Relief Corps, eventually uh, sons of Union veterans, for example. Now, of course, in a lot of northern cities, places like Pittsburgh, um, these gatherings are fairly easy to execute. In a place like Richmond, Virginia, it might be a little bit different. Um, you know, of course, there were GAR posts in the South, but they aren't receiving as much assistance as uh, those up here in the North. You know, part of the funds that are put out to these different posts by the GAR that are, that are distributed are going toward you know, buying flowers, are going toward purchasing flags uh, to place on the graves of Union dead. But as I'll show you here in, in just a, a moment, um, you know, some of these veterans in the South that are posted in the South uh, find it difficult to carry out this task. So, <clears throat> John Adams, uh, on September 12th, 1894, uh, says, uh, by vote of the 27th National Cam and all monies contributed for decorating the graves in the South were sent through the Quartermaster General and enough was received through the Grand Army of the Republic, Women's Relief Corps, and Sons of Veterans to fill every requisition for flags. I do not think we fully appreciate the work of our comrades in the South, and believe in a larger expenditure of money for the proper observance of the Memorial Day. Our Southern comrades are scattered in little bands surrounded in every hand by the graves of our dead, with little or no sympathy from the citizens in their vicinity. They have performed their duty faithfully. 
It is an easy thing for comrades in the North to observe the day. The communities where the posts are located are in full sympathy with them, and cities and towns make appropriation to defray the expenses. In the South, however, posts have neither moral nor financial assistance. Take, for instance, the day in Richmond. Uh, every, everything possible was done to turn the day and the occasion into a glorification of the lost cause. But our comrades of that city, loyal and true to those who died for the right, marched to Seven Pines and other battlefields and laid their garlands of love upon the graves. And so he mentions this thing, the lost cause. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with uh, this idea of the lost cause. It's perpetuated in the post-war period. In fact, I believe whoever uh, was here for uh, Matt Callery's talk, I'll give him a little shout out right here. Uh, he describes the lost cause as a, a painting, I believe. And he talks about uh, the lost cause being this level of or, uh, thick soot on that painting that needs to be removed. Um, it's this interpretation that, you know, kind of expresses the idea that the Civil War is not about slavery, that the, uh, the Union armies won because they, of course, had superior numbers. Um, but, of course, the lost cause speaks more to uh, Southern valor, um, of course. Uh, and, th and that's really what they reflect in a lot of the monumentation that you see uh, in the post-war period, especially the 1890s. As I mentioned, a lot of these guys are trying to figure, how do we, how do we memorialize what we did during the Civil War? That doesn't just go for Union veterans, that goes for Confederate veterans as well. How do they memorialize that? Um, but I think what uh, is initially set up as memorialization is eventually mistaken for, for actual history. Um, and so, you know, this was not lost on these, these veterans like John Adams, a guy who spent nine months in prison, who was wounded three times by Confederate, uh, Confederate fire. Um, and, you know, of course, this, this uh, holiday that they had set up, if you want to call it a holiday, this observance, Memorial Day, um, is a day that we remember the Union dead. Well, in some cases, this observance that's been set up by the Grand Army of the Republic is disgraced by their former foes in the South. Uh, and one of these accounts I wanted to share with you uh, from actually 1894, so just a few months before the encampment in Pittsburgh, um, the Assistant Inspector General for Virginia and North Carolina, part of the GAR, uh, writes a letter. He's, you know, of course, he's president here in 1894, but in August, um, just a couple of weeks before this gathering, uh, he writes a letter and he talks about the Memorial Day gathering in Richmond, Virginia, and how this day is being disgraced by those uh, who are present. Excuse me. He says, the high water mark of the Grand Army of the Republic in this department has no doubt been reached. A few years more in our long and unequal struggle will have ended. For in no section of the United Union has the existence of the Grand Army of the Republic been threatened to the extent it has here. Upon the one side, we are contending against overwhelming numbers and resources. On the other, we are expected to keep abreast of our more favored comrades of the North and caring for him who has borne the battle for his widow and orphan, and suitably remembering each year for the 100,000 graves of our heroic dead. A few years ago, our comrades of the North, East, and West contributed nearly $20,000 toward the erection of a home in this city for indignant, indignant Confederates. And whilst this generosity on the part of those comrades was most commendable, it is not strange that with more than 100,000 comrades buried in this department to be remembered, and with an urgent need of substantial support and some well-considered plan for the building up of a wider loyal sentiment here, that beyond contributing toward Memorial Day expenses, our loyal friends of the North have been the more generous to the other side. The sentiments expressed by Reverend Cave, who I'll talk about in just a minute, at the recent unveiling of a monument to the Confederate soldiers and sailors up in the city and their hearty endorsement by Confederate camp and the Southern people generally has given rise to much earnest discussion between the two sections of our common country. Since Mr. Cave and the well nigh whole South avowed sentiments which if allowed to prevail would again threaten the life of the Republic, it is well perhaps that this incident occurred as it confirms our contention that there are none so loyal to our country's flag 
as those who fought to uphold it. And that true allegiance to the national government cannot be maintained by any citizen who would hold to the views that the surrender of Appomattox settled nothing. The Union soldier cannot become reconciled to any proposition which does not condemn such teachings. They further hold that he who prefers the company of the Confederate flag to that of old glory makes assurance doubly sure that there is such a thing as dividing one's allegiance between two flags on the line of loving one and respecting the other. In this connection, I must give you the reply of one of my comrades here when asked what he thought of the immense display of Confederate flags on occasion of the unveiling above referred to. He observed that upon the question of allowing two flags to represent the American people, the North was not unlike the South, for they revered one and tolerated the other. The South did the same, but they were not the same flags. And so uh, you can actually see in this photograph I have on the screen, this is the, uh, the, the monument he's actually referring to. Um, this dedication took place on May 30th, 1894. What else happens on May 30th every year? Memorial Day, right. So uh, this dedication, this Confederate monument dedication is being held on Memorial Day. It was declared an observance by the Grand Army of the Republic. And so the, uh, the uh, incendiatory uh, um, speech that I want to share with you is uh, actually given by Reverend Robert Catlett Cave. Um, he's uh, the keynote speaker at the dedication here. Um, and he really, this is the speech that not only really upset the, uh, um, the GAR member who had written this letter that I read to you, um, but it kind of becomes a big deal across the nation. Um, a lot of people share their feelings on this specific speech because, of course, it does not lend itself to this idea of reconciliation between North and South. Um, Cave says, Appomattox was a triumph of the physically stronger in a conflict between the representatives of two essentially different civilizations and antagonistic ideas of government. On one side in that conflict was the South, led by the descendants of the Cavaliers who, with all their faults, had inherited from a, a long line of ancestors a manly contempt for moral littleness, a high sense of honor, a lofty regard for plighted faith, a strong tendency to conservatism, a profound respect for law and order, and an unfaltering loyalty to constitutional government. Against the South was arrayed the power of the North, donated by the spirit of Puritanism, which worships itself and is unable to perceive any goodness apart from itself, which has ever arrogantly held its ideas, its interests, and its will to be higher than fundamental law and covenanted obligations, which with the cry of freedom on its lips has been one of the most cruel and pitiless tyrants that ever cursed the world. Does that sound reconciliatory to you? No. Let's go on. In which from the time of Oliver Cromwell to the time of Abraham Lincoln has never hesitated to trample upon the rights of others in order to effect its own ends. And finally, says that Appomattox, Puritanism, backed by overwhelming numbers and unlimited resources, prevail. I believe that the South was in the right and that her cause was just, that the men who took up arms in her defense were patriots, who had even better reason for what they did than had the men who fought at Concord, Lexington, and Bunker Hill. That's a bold statement. And that her coercion, whatever good may have resulted or may hereafter result from it, was an outrage on liberty. That's all I'll say about that. Um, and of course, there's other, other challenges that are being addressed um, in 1894 as well. Um, you know, it's not just the, the GAR veterans, but also their support system, the Women's Relief Corps. Um, I don't think they get enough attention. The Women's Relief Corps, uh, established initially in, in 1879 in Massachusetts, are, uh, of course, raising funds for these men. They're the ones that are helping to establish homes for these veterans as they get to a point in their lives where uh, they may not be able to take care of themselves. Uh, they're helping orphans, of course. Um, they are the support system that keeps the GAR running as we move into the, the dawn of the 20th century. And they're founded just like uh, the Grand Army of the Republic. They're founded on several pr core principles um, that I'll share with you here. Uh, first, to specially aid and assist the Grand Army of the Republic and to perpetuate the memory of their heroic dead. 
Two, to assist such union veterans as may need help and protection and to extend needful aid to their widows and orphans, to find them homes and employment and assure them of sympathy and friends, and to cherish and emulate the deeds of the army nurses and all of loyal women who rendered loving service to our country in our hour of peril. Finally, third, is to maintain true allegiance to the United States of America, uh, to, uh, to instill lessons of patriotism and love of country among the children and in the community, and encourage the spread of universal liberty and equal rights for all. And so not only are they, they kind of serving as this uh, fundraising organization, but they're much more active than that. They're actually going into schools. They're approaching young people and trying to instill in them this idea of patriotism. You know, what, what these guys did during the Civil War, of course, helped preserve the, the rights to liberty that we enjoy today. Um, but that's, you know, that's not saying that they're, they, they're, of course, met with different challenges along the way. There's people who want to prevent them from uh, pursuing uh, this goal. And so this is one of the things that John Adams addresses uh, on September 12th uh, as he is um, uh, talking to not only the Women's Relief Corps, but GAR veterans uh, in the audience. Um, and he says, of course, born under my administration when I was commander of the Department of Massachusetts, I have seen them grow from a little band of earnest women to more than 140,000 located wherever a Grand Army post could be found or a worthy comrade or his family required some assistance. For the first time this year, the Women's Relief Corps was officially represented in the National Council of Women by Mrs. Sarah Mink, who you can see on the left-hand side there, uh, national president. We are indebted to the Women's Relief Corps for the salute to the flag now given in many, many public schools throughout the loyal states. It is an aspiring sight to see the children standing with the right hands pointed to the flag, then carried to their head and heart. Thus far, they have only been able to enter the schools of the states that are true to the Union. It is not possible to go into the schools of the South carrying our flag and theirs and teaching the children that we are one country and have one common destiny. I am unable to understand why so many who wandered from their father's house will persist in cherishing love for a cause that is forever lost and refuse to return and eat the bread of loyalty under the stars and stripes. And so, of course, these teachers are trying to take these uh, books, uh, for example, that are written about the true uh, history of the War of the Rebellion, taking these books and stories into these public schools and just being shot down in the American South. Of, of course, as uh, Adam said, um, as they're teaching these stories in places like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it's not as much uh, of an issue. But this is, you know, of course, one of these um, you know, obstacles that are being run into, not just by Grand Army veterans, but those who are, are here to help them. And of course, we also have uh, a whole demographic of Union uh, Army veterans, Navy veterans, uh, Marines, um, who had their own hardships in the post-war period. Of course, I'm talking about African-American veterans. Um, now, I mentioned before that September 11th, September 12th, and even uh, September 13th, these U.S. military veterans are having their own meetings around the city of Pittsburgh, um, taking over uh, government buildings, county buildings, um, some private buildings uh, will lend themselves to their, their meeting spaces. And among those meeting spaces is the old Bethany AME Church on Wiley Avenue in the Hill District. Now, um, this photograph was actually taken, if, if any of you are familiar with um, Charles Teeny Harris, a uh, famous uh, African-American photographer from Pittsburgh. This is in the uh, um, Carnegie uh, Museum of Art collection. Um, this is the church in the mid 1950s on Wiley Avenue. It stood for maybe about a decade more and, uh, when eventually it was knocked down to make room for uh, the Civic Arena and the giant parking lot. Um, but it was fairly historic, not just because of what happened here in 1894, um, but also it was said to have been a stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, so, of course, this building is quite significant to the Black community here uh, in Pittsburgh. In 1894, this becomes a meeting place for African-American veterans, uh, men of 
Uh, uh, Robert Gould Shaw Post 206, for example, uh, veterans of the 54th, 55th Massachusetts Infantry, uh, 5th Massachusetts Cavalry uh, will meet in this building on uh, September 12th, 1894. And the conversations that they're having differ uh, in many ways from the conversations that other folks are having around town. Um, their experience in the post-war period has been much different from a lot, uh, a lot of white veterans, for example. Um, if they're to travel south, let's say to Virginia, to Tennessee, to Louisiana, do you think they're going to be treated any different from white veterans? Yes, absolutely, they will be. Um, you know, of course, one uh, large issue here uh, in the United States between the 1870s, 80s, 90s, into the 20th century is, um, is lynching. You know, African Americans are being lynched by the hundreds. Between 1880 and about 1920, we know of 4,000 that take place in the American South. Um, one of the people that uh, takes a stance uh, on lynching the American South is a young woman named Ida B. Wells. Uh, you may have heard of her. Uh, in 1892, uh, two of her friends in Memphis uh, were lynched. Of course, she's pushed out of town and she starts this large campaign to pass uh, anti-lynching laws. So veterans, of course, become supportive. They become vocal about what she's trying to do. Of course, they're uh, in support of desegregation, uh, in support of eliminating racial violence uh, throughout the country. And so um, on September 17th, 1894, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette publishes an account um, talking about one of these meetings. Um, they, uh, the, the, the title is, and I believe, uh, Diane, you shared this in your publication about the Shaw Post, is Against Lynch Law, Colored Veterans Are Opposed to the Southern Custom. Um, and the, the account says, at the campfire of the colored veterans last Thursday evening, resolutions were adopted denouncing the practice of lynch law in the South. The resolution stated that these outrages are daily growing in frequency. They endorsed the work of Miss Ida B. Wells, a young colored woman who has been working in the interests of the anti-lynching league. The campfire recommends that colored people in the several states start a fund and assist each other in securing their rights at all public places of amusements, uh, whether it be hotels, et cetera. Um, the, uh, the Pittsburgh Press says on September 14th, uh, if these outrages cannot be stopped by other means and all other methods do not avail, we should not hesitate to offer our lives to the cause of our redemption and salvation. And of course, I want to share an account from this gentleman who's pictured uh, on the screen here. Um, when they met in the church, James Lewis, who uh, was a, a veteran from around New Orleans, uh, he's actually uh, the commander of the Department of Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, he makes a bold statement as well um, in trying to uh, make social change in the American South. He says, every day our race in the South is being outraged. On the slightest breath of a suspicion, a man will be hung to a tree. And since I have come North, I've been asked why we stood such things. We have to stand it. It took the North four years to whip the South and we must stand it. The only way, the only way for the colored man to become more manly and try to win the respect of his fellow men. The black man in the South has no soldier's home to go when he is old. He must eke out a miserable existence and die and be buried in a pauper's grave. Even the money we earned during the war has never been paid. When we were discharged, we were given our discharge papers and told to take them to the paymaster. He endorsed them and told us to deposit them in the Freedmen's Bank. We did so. But the bank broke and our deposits are there yet. So, of course, there's, there's these different battles that are being fought on different planes for different demographics that are present uh, at this uh, 1894 encampment. And, of course, um, it's not just the U.S. military veterans um, that are speaking to this idea of um, you know, social change and, and reconciliation. Of course, uh, there's a very well-known Confederate general that's going to be here for the 28th annual encampment. Um, John B. Gordon. How many of you are familiar with his military record? Okay. So John B. Gordon, of course, I believe he's wounded, correct me if I'm wrong, eight times during the war. Um, you know, of course, after the war is over, John B. Gordon eventually goes on to serve as 
uh, governor of Georgia. He's, he's serving uh, as a senator, a representative of the state of Georgia. And uh, he's a big supporter of this idea of reconciliation between North and South. Sorry, I'm going to skip over uh, the SV post there. Um, so, of course, this is John Gordon here on the left. Um, this is taken about 1880. Um, and on the right, I'll get to this guy in a, in a minute, uh, Francis Barlow. Um, how many, I, I assume everyone here has been to Gettysburg before, right? That's safe to assume. Okay. How many haven't been to Gettysburg? Okay. So you've been, uh, there's a, a section on the battlefield some of you may be familiar with, uh, Barlow's Knoll, as it's referred to today. So uh, John B. Gordon's story of reconciliation is, is quite interesting, and it's, it's become fairly well known over the years. Um, but first, let me talk about why he's here in the first place. Um, John B. B. Gordon, as these U.S. veterans are meeting here in Pittsburgh, uh, is going to come, <clears throat> excuse me, come here, um, you know, looking to share this idea of, of reconciliation. What better place to do it when you have thousands of U.S. veterans gathered here? Um, he's actually going to deliver a speech that he delivered uh, just months before in New York City as well. Um, and uh, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette actually uh, published an account about John B. Gordon's arrival in Allegheny City being met by U.S. veterans and ushered in to the encampment. Um, so they, they said, uh, John B. Gordon quartered at the Duquesne Hotel and alone among the thousands of Union veterans against whom he led sturdy troops of the Confederacy. Uh, a former Lieutenant General of the Southern Armies. General Gordon felt too fatigued last night to talk much to the newspaper men, but when asked what feeling now existed among the veterans of the Confederacy, of whom, by the way, he is commander in chief, he said, the Confederate soldiers furnished a reply to any doubt as to their feeling toward their Northern friends by their action in the Confederate convention held in Birmingham in June. A proposition was made to send a delegation North to have the next encampment of the GAR veterans held in Atlanta. The proposition was only opposed by one man, and he was very promptly and properly jumped on by every other man present. General Gordon has come here to deliver his lecture on the, the last days of the Confederacy. So this is the, the speech they delivered in New York not long before, uh, in Old City Hall. Some of the old soldiers here recall an incident in which General Gordon was a prominent actor. When advancing with his command at Gettysburg, his attention was called to a Union general who lay badly wounded. The apparently dying man requested General Gordon to send some papers he had to his wife. 20 years later, General Gordon met a General Francis Barlow at a dinner, uh, actually at the, the home of New York Representative Clarkson Potter in Washington, D.C. And on being introduced, asked him if he was any relative of a General Barlow that was killed before Gettysburg. A hearty handshake followed, and the announcement that this Brown, Lowe, Brown Barlow was the same he had left for dead on the battlefield. And so, you know, John B. Gordon, um, I believe he first had this story published uh, in 1879. Of course, a lot of other papers across the country pick up the same story. And so it becomes very familiar to U.S. veterans across the country. It became, it became a very popular story of you know, uh, brother versus brother, a man helping someone else uh, out on the battlefield, even though he's on the opposite side. Uh, and of course, this kind of lends itself to this story of reconciliation in the post-war period. It sounds like a really nice story. Um, and there's, there's a lot of truth to it. Um, but some believe that maybe it didn't happen the, the way that, uh, that Gordon presents it. Uh, he might have taken liberty with some different details. Um, perhaps he uh, didn't actually uh, help Brownlow um, uh, communicate with his wife behind the lines. Um, but either way, the, the way it worked out, the way it's remembered in American memory um, and, and universal reconciliation is that this Confederate soldier helped this Union soldier. And uh, this is really how we should feel about uh, reconciliation as we move forward as a country, helping out one another. Um, even though, of course, as I shared with you in some previous accounts, that's not necessarily how, how everybody felt. Um, there's a lot of people who do harbor hard feelings for those North uh, and those South. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, John B. Gordon, he uh, being a former Confederate, uh, is also serving as a U.S. Senator 
in the, at the end of the 19th century, uh, representing Georgia. And this is one thing that, that some Union veterans uh, you know, held against their, their former foes, um, especially as they're trying to uh, collect pensions, for example. They're trying to get uh, financial help as we move into the 20th century. And um, there's actually one, one account that I want to share with you uh, that was read aloud uh, on September 10th, 1894 at this convention um, by the Committee on Legislation of the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, and they mentioned um, uh, specifically uh, their former foes. They said, as the war's days recede further from the remembrance of the people of the generation of which we formed a part, and the sacrifices and sufferings of those days are unknown except by tradition to those that have since been born, the greatest indifference seems to be shown on the part of our national lawmakers toward those who fought the battles of the Union and still survive. In consequence, but scant attention is paid to any appeals made for justice to these men. And this will continue to be so unless we, as members of the Grand Army of the Republic, become more closely united in a fraternity, in quotes, which means something as a cardinal principle. And the motto of our order is regarded as more than a figure of speech among ourselves. Your committee have failed, your committee have faithfully tried to discharge their duty so as to secure all veterans of the Civil War a legal right to preference in every public employment under the national government, but have received little encouragement. So not only they're trying to secure uh, pensions, for example, they're trying to secure employment. Uh, I know as, um, you know, of course, uh, working for the, the federal government that today veterans get 10 minutes. Veterans get preference for hiring. That's not necessarily the case here in the 1890s. This is something that this commission is arguing for. They say, this can hardly be wondered at when we reflect that the men who fought to destroy the union now dominate and control in both legislative branches of the national government. Of course, some of the people referring to is John B. Gordon right here. No successful appeal can be made to the enemies of this country, many of them as much so now as they were in the war days. And we may be permitted to say here that those not now reconstructed never will be for justice to the soldiers and the sailors of the Union. Such men do not understand they never did the meaning of patriotism. For them, old glory has no charm and the country no significance. And they say very boldly, they are not Americans. But of course, they still hold out hope for the future. Um, you know, there's still many veterans, as I mentioned, um, there's approximately 400,000 across the country uh, that are at least part of the GAR uh, still living, and they hold out hope for the future as we move forward. Um, a symbol of this reconcil re reconciliation um, are these objects you see on the screen here. These two chairs and this side table um, that were actually taken uh, from Appomattox. Um, one chair, uh, the one on the left, that swivel chair there was sat in by Ulysses S. Grant, the one on the right by Robert E. Lee. And uh, that table in the middle, I believe, was uh, snatched by Phil Sheridan uh, and presented to George Custer's wife, was the table that Ulysses S. Grant uh, drafted the terms of surrender. And so, of course, this is present. This is actually loaned uh, to the, the gathering uh, by uh, George, Ar George Armstrong Custer's widow. Um, and it, it's, of course, this that becomes a talking point uh, used by John Adams when talking about hope for the future. He said, as I reflect that on that table, General Grant accepted the surrender of General Lee, I think of his words, let us have peace. And how the shouts went up from the boys when they found that Lee had surrendered. And although they had stood in front of the Army of Northern Virginia for four years, there was no feeling of bitterness in their hearts that day but their hands went out to the men they had been fighting. They shared their rations with them and said, all we ask is that you shout for the flag and we will be with you and go on and plant the star spangled banner upon every hilltop. And that is the position of the grand army of the Republic today. We want to plant the flag so high that the South will love it as much as we do. And we want them to put their Confederate flag out of sight and go with us. So uh, with that, uh, John Eric has told me I only have a couple minutes left. So uh, are there any, uh, any questions for me? Yes. Can you 
I've heard of that. Is that still standing? Oh, wow. I, I thought it got demolished. Turtle Creek. Turtle Creek. Hmm? Oh, really? Okay. Okay. So the, okay, but it, is it still standing though? Okay. Uh, were you successful? Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Good start. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know if that church online we have the oh no, that's that's long gone. Where, uh, as I mentioned, where uh, Civic Arena used to be, it was right over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know one of their meetings was charity for other veterans. Um, is it attention paid to like drug abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, PTSD? Is what they call that. I don't. That, I, that, um, did they do it? I think that that's kind of covered in these veterans homes is things like uh, substance abuse uh, as far as far as uh, you know what we now know is PTSD I'm unsure of that uh, someone else might be able to speak to that but but not me yeah, yeah there's a book called um, book called Joke Over Hell that it's kind of anecdotal really uh, or a scientific study of what we now call PTSD. What's the good and probably what was it called? Shook over hell. Shook over hell. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Yes. Uh, down in West Virginia, oh. there was a uh, book called the Terry Trap. Uh, there was a you know, Terry Trap. We only had five of them still. Right. Any idea why they named that one? It was modified. Well, that's the. the Really interesting thing about the GAR, which I did not mention is, and I think uh, John Eric put it best, is this is the great equalizer. Um, guys who may have served, you know, for example, John Adams, who's commander in chief in 1894, he started as a private. Um, you guys, you have guys who are privates who could be, you know, the commander of a post while maybe their commanding officer during the war is, is simply just a member. Um, and of course, a lot of these posts are going to be named after and, and more often than not, of people who were killed during the war. Um, the Captain Thomas Espy Post, for example, is a great example. Yep, right there. Is there a particular reference that is a good one to find a photograph and information from 1891? It's like a publication or? Yeah. I don't think anyone's. So I, I, um, I'm fortunate in that I was able to track down some of the original programs such as this. Uh, there's uh, one on the back table that Rick actually has. Uh, one of the bigger ones was published beforehand. Um, and there's a lot of great information in that as far as, you know, the parade routes. Um, you know, they had uh, uh, on, on Monument, um, Monument Hill in Mount Washington, you know, 30 foot tall GAR electric lights and things like that. Very specific and very interesting uh, accounts. Um, but as far as kind of a, a more contemporary publication on the encampment, uh, I haven't found anything. Yeah. The uh, GAR published the encampments. So Crane or Pittsburgh. And then, yeah, when I worked with Colby Taylor, we went all over the. Um, if, if you have a subscription to newspaper.com, that's also a great resource. They okay. they publish stuff every single day up to and after. Yeah. Yeah, I we also we also mentioned the historic Pittsburgh uh has those programs and you can view the PDF. I didn't realize that. That's great. Yeah. I had two questions about the photographs. Um, the not the smell of yeah. Yeah. Um, what building is that? Um, I I'm actually it unsure. Familiar, it looks familiar, but I, I I'm not sure which building. They didn't say what building that was. And um, the other question is the arch 
What would have to build that? I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, I think there, and there might be one other photograph uh, similar to this that might be a little bit closer. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I know that they took a couple of months beforehand to start constructing these arches, though. And they had three of them. Um, there's one on Fifth Avenue. I think they had uh, one in Allegheny City. And 